Good morning and thanks for joining us. I invite you today to join us as we worship the Lord, as we sing songs, as we pray together, as we worship together, and as we learn from God's Word. I hope that you're excited to worship the Lord today, and I would uh, invite you to share this video with your friends or, or tag someone that you think may enjoy uh, being with us in worship today. I hope that you are glad that you're here. We're going to open today with a time of offering and tithes, and we're going to pray that the Lord blesses our service and blesses our time together today. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you that, that we have avenues that we can meet together even during unusual times like this. I pray for those around our country as they make decisions about what to do if they decide to meet together, if they decide to continue to do things online, to do things different ways. Lord, I pray for our other churches that are out there, Lord. I pray that you would be with our church, continue to strengthen our church, allow us to honor you with our offerings, with our tithes, and with our lives, Lord, I pray that you would just be with us today and that everything we say and do would be honoring to you. It's in your name we pray.
to me God is holding on And when the night is holding on to me God is holding on for worshiping with us today. Uh, this week, we begin a new sermon series. We wrapped up one last week, and we begin a new sermon series this week around the idea of isolation. Right now, 
we've all been isolated in some shape or form for a little while, some more than others. When, when our governor issued the order that we were to shelter in place, we all had some decisions to make. What would isolation look like to us? For some, that's, that meant they still had to go to work, that their family stayed home and they went to work. Others are out and about much more. Uh, some people, they just see family. Some people see family and friends. We all had decisions about what to make, what to do, and it, it varied on each individual family and each decision that they made. However, I think that now that we've been in this for a while, we're all feeling a little bit of the hurt from the isolation in one way or another. And part of the problem, I think, is the not knowing. Not knowing when this is going to end, not knowing when it's going to wrap up. We were supposed to be done with this in early April, and then it would be the end of April. Now it's the end of May. And, and this, this uncertainty, I think, is really starting to get to some people. Um, I think a lot of people have a desire to go back to normal. And, and then you have people saying, oh, don't go back to normal. And, and oh, everything's going to be fine. We'll go back to normal. And don't think about it. Normal, this is the new normal. And, and we hear all of these things. Uh, but over the next few weeks, I want us to look at some different people in the Bible that spent time alone with the Lord. Each of these people were in isolation for a different reason. But as we face isolation, I hope that we can see that there are people in the Word that we can learn from. Isolation and, and quarantine, they're scary times. Lots of questions, lots of emotions. One thing that's been hitting me this week, I, I had a really tough week last week. Now, this week, I've had a different emotion, and I think that, that you probably all agree with me. It's, it's an emotional roller coaster. You have good days, you have bad days. But one emotion that I've been feeling this week and uh, off and on throughout the whole quarantine time has been one of sadness. But not sadness in the way that you may be thinking, but sadness when I see and when I hear people complaining about the people that they are isolated with. Um, I see people complain a lot about their kids, and I see people complain a lot about their spouses. I see people complain a lot about going to work or not going to work. I think that we need to take a step back. Think about it like this. For those of you that are quarantined with your spouse and you complain about being quarantined with your spouse, I know and I have spoken to single people out there who would love nothing more than to have a spouse to be quarantined with. As we complain about our kids and as people complain about their kids, I talk to people and I know that there are people out there struggling today who would give anything to have children to be quarantined with. Those that complain about going to their job would love nothing. There are people out there who would love nothing more than to have a job to go to. For those that complain about staying home, there are people going to work every day who would love to be able to stay home. You see, we all complain about the situation that we're in, and I think that if we stepped outside of that just a little bit, we would see that there are other people that would love to be where we're at. And, and it's crazy the amount of complaining, but I want us to think about this. I want us to begin to think about our isolation, our quarantine. This time, I want us to begin to think of it as a mountaintop experience. Yes, you heard that right. Isolation can be a mountaintop experience. Where do we where do we think we got that term from? A mountaintop experience. I I've heard a lot of people talk about hills and valleys in their lives, the ups and downs and and having having a time having a mountaintop experience. And you know, I think when people talk about a mountaintop experience, many times in ministry and in church life, we're talking about going to a conference or we're talking about going to church camp, or we're talking about something big that has happened. And it, it really sets us on fire for the Lord. It's a real mountaintop experience. Now, many of these mountaintop experiences occur in a group setting, a mission trip, a, a conference that you went to, a church camp that you went to, any of these things, people would describe them as a mountaintop experience. But the thing that I want us to look at today is what I'm going to call the original mountaintop experience. The original mountaintop wasn't a flashy thing, and it wasn't a group gathering or of a big, of a big type or, or of any group for that matter. No, the original mountaintop experience was one man and God. 
Today we're going to look at the book of Exodus, and we're gonna we're gonna be a little bit all over in the book of Exodus, and I hope that you'll bear with me. We'll we'll pull out some key verses, but the original mountaintop experience occurs just at, the Israelites had just left Egypt. They had been captive. It was actually a plague that set them free. They escaped through miraculous means. There were plagues. There was this travel. They they set out and they arrived at Mount Sinai. They camped around the mountain that the Lord had led them to. This is the mountain that he had load he had led Moses back to. It's the same mountain. It's called Mount Horeb, but it's the same mountain where the Lord had spoken to Moses before. Here is where the Lord said that they would meet again in Exodus chapter 3. Let's look at those verses now. Exodus chapter 3, verses 11 and 12 say, But Moses asked God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And he answered, I will certainly be with you, and this will be the sign to you that I am the one when you bring the people out of Egypt, you will all worship God at this mountain. Now, at the beginning of Exodus, God tells Moses to bring the people back to the mountain. That's, where, that's what Moses' mission was. Moses' mission, when he set out, was to go to get the people from Egypt and to bring them to the mountain where the Lord had spoken to him. And it's here that Moses will go up and down the mountains. As we reach Exodus 19, we see that Moses has led the people out of Egypt. They are now at the mountain, Mount Sinai. And here, Moses will go up and down the mountain several times, speaking with the Lord and bringing that message to the people. I want us to focus on two such instances of Moses going up the mountain and see what we can learn about a real mountaintop experience. Let's begin in Exodus chapter 24. Remember in Exodus chapter 19, they arrived. Moses goes up a few times. One of those times is when he receives the Ten Commandments. But now in Exodus chapter 24, we see the Lord say, Moses alone is to approach the Lord. But the others are not to approach, and the people are not to go up with him. Moses came and told the people all the commands of the Lord and all the ordinances. Then all the people responded with a single voice, We will do everything that the Lord has commanded. Moses receives word at the beginning of Exodus chapter 24. Now, this is after he's already been up the mountain a couple of times, that he is to go up the mountain to the mountaintop alone again. At the end of chapter 24, we see Moses go up the mountain. In Exodus 24, 18, it says, Moses entered the cloud and he went up the mountain and he returned on, and he remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Now, 40 days and 40 nights, Moses went up the mountain and stayed there. Here's what I think from, we learned from this, this right here. Going in, Moses didn't know how long he was going up the mountain. At the beginning of Exodus, the Lord, or the beginning of chapter 24, the Lord tells Moses that he is to come and that he is to come alone. He goes not knowing how long he's going to be up there. He goes up the mountain not knowing that it's going to be for 40 days. I think that the situation we found ourselves in now is frustrating because we don't know when it's going to end. But when Moses went, he was following the Lord and he didn't know how long that was going to be and he didn't know how long he would be on the mountain and when it would end. Now, during the next eight chapters of Exodus, eight chapters, the Lord speaks to Moses. If we look at the scripture, as you turn those pages, if you want to look, it says, and the Lord said, and the Lord said, he's giving instructions for building the tabernacle, building the Ark of the Covenant, the table, the lampstands, the, the bronze basin, the priestly garments, every aspect of the garment, the breastplate, the hats, the hell, everything that they are to wear, go come out during this time. The Lord gives him explicit and direct instructions as to what he's supposed to do. Chapter after chapter, we read, the Lord spoke to Moses. Moses. The Lord spoke to Moses. The Lord said this. The Lord said this. This was a time during this 40 days of listening for Moses. 
There were times in Exodus that we read of, of a conversation of Moses saying something and the Lord saying something back. But right here, during this time, we read over and over again that it's pretty clear that it's the Lord giving instruction to Moses. Let me ask you, how much are you listening to the Lord right now? How much are you listening to what God has to say to you? There are times, and you might be right there right now, where, where you say, I just don't feel like God's speaking to me. I just, I just don't feel like God's saying anything. Do you think that that's because God has nothing to say? Or is it because you haven't stopped talking long enough to let him get a word in edgewise? I've had conversations with people, and I'm sure you have too, that have been like that, where you're having a conversation with them and they won't let you talk. They won't let you say anything. You know, it's, it's really unusual for me this way, whenever, whenever it comes to a sermon and preaching that, that I talk and, and I prefer Bible studies where, where we can have people, people talk back. I love seeing your faces when you're sitting out there. And so this is an unusual situation, but we find ourselves in, in situations like this all the time with the Lord. We just talk, 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 talk. And we never sit back and listen. Now, when it comes to a person, if I'm, if I'm in a conversation with someone and they're acting like that, they're talking and not letting me talk. They're talking about themselves and not asking about me. They're never letting me talk. We call those people users, don't we? They just come to see what they can get from you, and they're on their way. They talk about themselves. But we can't have a relationship with the Lordless like that. There's a time to talk, but there's a time to listen. Moses spent 40 days listening to God. Have you spent five minutes just sitting in silence and saying, God, what do you have to say to me? Something else happened interesting during that 40 days. And I, I want us to look at that for just a moment. In Exodus chapter 32 and verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed in coming down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us who will go before us. Because this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So Aaron builds what? Aaron builds probably the most famous idol of all time. That is the golden calf. And if you remember, we looked at Exodus 24 and verse 3. And I read that verse 3 because the, I want you to see that the same people that asked for the golden calf are the same people who just a few chapters earlier at chapter 24, verse 3, they said, we will do everything that the Lord has commanded. That's the last thing they told Moses. Moses said, I'm going up the mountain. They said, we'll do everything that the Lord has commanded. Moses leaves. He's gone for 40 days. And they ask for an idol. Make gods for us, they say. 40 days. That's how long it took them to lose their faith. To fall into idol worship and despair. Do you know how long Illinois has been on the shelter in place order? Do you know? I'll tell you. Illinois has been on a shelter in place order today marks 43 days. I find these numbers to be more than a little bit coincidental. May the 1st actually marked the 40 day mark. And I see it. I see people losing their faith. The problem is people had placed their faith in places it didn't belong. Instead of placing their faith in the Lord, who never leaves us, who never forsakes us, they placed their faith in, in politics and in leadership. But now that 40 days have passed, people are beginning to question that. But you see, the Israelites had done something very similar. They had placed their faith, instead of in the Lord where it belonged, they had placed their faith in Moses, in a man, in a leader. And that man was gone. And they didn't know when he would come back. And so their faith was shaken. 
They were forgetting that the Lord that led them out of Egypt had never left them. Do we do the same thing? Instead of looking at, at what God's done for us, we look at where we're at right now and we say that God's abandoned us. You may say, oh, we're not like, we're not like the Israelites. We, we had freedom and we were led into captivity. That's where we're at now. And that's why I'm frustrated. We had freedom. We're led into captivity. They were in captivity and they were led to freedom. Is that the way you see it? The way I see it, we were captives to sin. And we've still been set free from that. Regardless of where we live, regardless of where around this globe we live and whatever's going on, we've been set free from our sin and our faith needs to remain in the Lord that set us free. Can we do it? Even when our situation isn't ideal. Don't allow uncertain times to shake your faith. Our God remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. Moses was angry with the Israelites, but after his anger passed, he began to speak to the Lord again. The next thing that Moses does occurs in Exodus chapter 33. He begins to ask the Lord to seek his glory and to see his face. So in Exodus chapter 34, the Lord makes, a, makes plans to invite Moses up the mountain into isolation again. Exodus 34 verses 2 and 3 read this way. Be prepared by morning. Come up Mount Sinai in the morning and stand before me on the mountaintop. No one may go up with you. In fact, no one should be seen anywhere on the mountain. Even the flocks and herds are not to graze in front of that mountain. Once again, we see Moses is going alone. Once again, he's there. He's, once he is there, the Lord places him in the small of a rock and he covers him with his hand and Moses sees the back of the Lord. Moses spent this time seeking the glory of the Lord. Before he spent time listening and now he's seeking the glory of the Lord. Is this something that we are doing? Are we, during our time of isolation, seeking the glory of the Lord? Are we seeking his face, his glory, his will for our life? Or are we seeking our own face, our own glory, our own will? What does that even look like? Are we waking up each morning and asking, Lord, show me what's your will for this day? Or do we say, God, here's what I'm going to do. I hope you find a place in my day. Are you waking up each morning and asking to see his face? Moses had to ask the Lord. Moses said, God, I want to see your face. And Moses was earnestly seeking the Lord. As I thought about this, I thought about some time in a time when I, when I was in Uganda. I asked some of my Ugandan friends, I said, you know what? I hear other missionaries and they have a Ugandan name. Will you give me a Ugandan name? And they said, mm, no. <laughs> okay. And they said, no, it's okay. It's, it's something that you earn. A name is something that you earn. And so once we know you, once we know your heart, once we understand you, then we can give you a name. So, some time went by and then it, it was my birthday. And they said, we want to give you a, a gift for your birthday. And so they gave me a gift and the gift was a name. The name in Runyankori was Tumuramye. Tumuramye. I still remember it. I remember it because of the name that I held dear to my heart. Because I asked them, what does that mean? And they said, Tumuramye means one who earnestly seeks after the will of the Lord. And I thought of all the things that I could be remembered for, 
It would be one of the greatest honors of my whole life if the thing that I could be remembered for is that I was one who earnestly sought after the will of the Lord. And that's what they gave me. And it was one of the greatest gifts that I've ever received. I cherished that name and I held it close. It was a mountaintop experience. This journey up the mountain for, for Moses was the original mountaintop experience. And we get this term from what happens at the end of chapter 34. At Exodus 34, 29, we see that Moses, it says, As Moses descended from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands as he descended the mountain, he did not realize that the skin of his face shown as a result of his speaking with the Lord. You see, if you are seeking God's face, if you are seeking God's glory, it's going to show to those around you. If people look at your face, if they see you, do they see the glory of the Lord? Does the glory of the Lord show from you? If we seek the Lord, it shows. I want to tell you another story, and this is about one of my boys. Isaiah, my middle son, was playing in uh, at, at Bell Rive Baptist Church at their Upward Bound program. And they give out stars for different things at the end of the night. And um, they give out a star for the best offensive player, a star for the best defensive player, stars for, for lots of different things. But then the last star they give out to the team each night is the Christ-like star. And so his coach said, Isaiah, I'm giving you the Christ-like star because tonight when I looked at you, I thought you really looked like Jesus. And he was so proud. And he went outside afterwards and he said, Mom, Grammy, I got the Christ-like star. And they were so proud of him. And he said, you know what? She said, I look like Jesus. But everybody else always tells me I look like my dad. And we thought that was the funniest thing because he, he didn't quite understand exactly that, that he was showing his love for the Lord, that it was overflowing from him. When people see you, what do they see? Do they see that you have sought the face of the Lord the way they could see it on Moses? Or do they see that you're seeking the face of something else? There's one last thing I want to point out about this mountaintop experience. And that's what it led to. If you have your Bible, you can turn through the next few pages and you can look at what happens in Exodus 36 through 40. That's the end of the book. For the rest of the book, one after another, we read about projects getting done. Maybe you have a, a quarantine list of projects that you want to get done. You see, here's the pattern that's set up by Moses. Moses listened to God. Moses sought the Lord's glory. And then Moses was obedient and put into practice what the Lord had told him to do. You know, I think sometimes the Lord tells us what to do. And even if we are listening, maybe we aren't seeking his face enough to put it into practice. Or maybe we're even seeking his face. But when it comes to putting it into practice, that's when we fall apart. That's when we begin to have a problem. Putting into practice what the Lord has told us to do. I think it's because we're not seeking his face. We're not seeking his glory. We need to listen to the Lord. We need to seek his face. And then we need to put into practice what he told us to do. Right now, we find ourselves in a time of isolation. Are we going to be sad and complained and depressed about that? Are we going to continue to be negative? Or are we going to look at this as a possible mountaintop experience? A time in which we can listen to the Lord. A time in which we can seek his face. And a time in which we can prepare for the time in which we're set free and we can put into practice what the Lord is teaching us right now. Think about that. 
are we doing the first two things? Because I know when the time comes, after this quarantine's over, people are going to want to get out and do things. But let's take a step back and another step back. And let's begin to listen to the Lord and seek his face and his glory so that what we put into practice is what the Lord wants us to do. Do you think we can do that? Let's allow this time of quarantine to be a mountaintop. Be glad you're with who you're with. The Lord has put you where he wants you. Be with those people. Love them. Show them the glory of the Lord. Show them that you are listening to God, that you are seeking his face. Maybe there are things that you can begin to put in practice in your home right now so that your family can leave this time of isolation, this mountaintop experience, and be prepared for what the world has after. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, I pray that our time of isolation right now can be a mountaintop experience, a time in which we listen to you, a time in which our faith remains strong, a time in which we seek your face and we prepare for the time to put into practice what you're teaching us now. I pray that we begin by listening today to what you have to say to us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord
for being with us today. I would invite you to check out our website at www.phbcmv.org as well as our Facebook page. We communicate a lot through our Facebook page and we'd invite you to like that. I want to encourage you this week especially as we gear up for Mother's Day to like our Facebook page. We'll be doing some fun giveaways for those in our community for some moms this week and I, I think you'll have a lot of fun but I do want to direct you there. There's a link in the description of this video where you can like Pleasant Hill Baptist Church and we'll be in touch with you through that this week. And we look forward to, to celebrating moms in the coming week. And next week, uh, we'll have some special things in our service as we, as we approach Mother's Day. Um, I thank you so much for being here with us today. I pray that you are blessed, and I pray that the Lord is with you this week. Have a great day.